Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And um, yeah, I'll get into it. I understand that uh, many of you probably don't work on AGN Jet, so quick, quick primer on what an AGN Jet and its associated radio load is. Uh, so here we have an image of Cygnus A uh, or Centaurus A. Cygnus. Yeah, Cygnus. Cygnus. yeah. I was saying, I'm pretty sure it's Cygnus. <laughs> but, um, Cygnus. Yeah. Um, and its radio emission is shown in the kind of pinky red. Um, and we've got some X ray emission shown in blue of the kind of cluster gas. And uh, so, what these jets do, they are launched by uh, supermassive black holes at the of galaxies, the active galactic nucleus. Um, and they kind of um, expand out into the environment. Um, so here uh, we have the jet, this kind of nice collimated structure uh, ending in the hot spot and kind of forming uh, the lobe through that flow. So it's kind of the uh, general anatomy <laughs> of an AGN jet. Um, and so this is uh, what's known as a FR2 or Panorov Riley class 2 source. Uh, and so, this is the type of source I uh, generally simulate. So, yeah. And we've got a few seconds. Um, so, yeah. So, Adrian Jet um, is, uh, so, yeah. So, the Adrian Jet interacts with its environment. And so that's kind of why we're interested in looking at them. So uh, we're pretty certain at this point that uh, feedback from AGN jets is pretty important for uh, galaxy formation and evolution. And um, so in galaxy evolution models, um, they impl implement some form of feedback, uh, but these kind of models are done on really large scales. And so you can't actually resolve a jet. So kind of what the UTAS team is I'm really interested in is how we can sim simulate AGN jet feedback and get a better idea of how feedback occurs in galaxy clusters um, for these larger scale models. Uh, so what we want to know is kind of how much energy do these jets provide to their environments and where do the jets deposit this energy and how uh, does the energy kind of move around? So that's kind of the question that um, we're concerned with the UTAS. So, um, yeah. So that's why we kind of care about AGN jets. So my um, project uh, that I've been working on the last little while uh, is kind of more concerned about how do we actually um, look at an AGN jet source and go, okay, what kind of, say, jet power does that have? Uh, so here's the size luminosity plot that um, some people in the room might, might recognize. <laughs> and uh, on this plot, basically, when you observe an AGN jet, you can see how big it is and how bright it is. So that's kind of what we're plotting here. Um, and these black tracks on the plot are the uh, evolutionary tracks that we can uh, create with models, analytical models. Um, and so whenever we observe a source, we only observe it at one point on this diagram. But the evolutionary track that goes through that one point, you might have several evolutionary tracks that intersect at different points on the diagram, uh, corresponding to different combinations of uh, jet power and environment uh, parameters. So you might have, say, a high power jet uh, in a low density environment that at one point in its evolution looks a lot like a low power jet in a high density environment. So we have this kind of degeneracy in the actual physical parameters of the system that we can't see just with our um, radio images. So um, this project I've been working on is go, okay, well, how can we solve this degeneracy, say using uh, some polarization information? So, um, we can do this using Faraday rotation. I'll explain briefly what Faraday rotation is. So when we have the jet, um, the radio emission is synchrotron radiation, and this is linearly polarized. And as this linearly polarized emission travels through um, space, it gets to us and our telescopes, um, it will travel through uh, magneto-ionized media. And so the polarization angle um, 
of this emission will change as it travels through, um, kind of like we can see in this diagram here. And so the amount that this polarization angle changes by is quantified by the uh, aptly named rotation measure, measure of rotation. Um, so that's Faraday rotation. But how does that actually help us with that uh, jet power environment density kind of um, degeneracy that we have? So here's a, uh, a little cartoon of the size luminosity plot. We've got some source that we've observed at some point. We've got these. Uh, two different uh, tracks, evolutionary tracks that might correspond to uh, creating that source. And we don't know which one uh, that might be. So what we have is a two-dimensional surface brightness image, um, but rotation measure, which I should probably go back to the previous slide to show the equation again, but rotation measure depends on the environment density and magnetic field along the line of sight. So you get a third dimension, you get the line of sight dimension. Um, and so that gives us extra information about the environment and um, that might help us solve our degeneracy here. So um, what we're interested in is finding uh, the density along the line of sight, um, which rotation measure depends on density. So we might be able to say something like, okay, so if we observe that a source has higher range of rotation measure values, maybe it's in a more dense environment. Um, and so maybe we can select kind of what evolutionary track produced that source um, so that we can learn about uh, how, uh, what the jet power is and so learn more about feedback and what kinds of jets exist in what kinds of environments and all that good fun stuff. So yeah, so what I've done is uh, run a few simulations, uh, looked at the rotation measure and tried to see if we can find a way to disentangle this degeneracy. So simulations. Uh, finally, some movies. I know it's like it's very cool uh, and it's really hot, so nice to have something to look at. Uh, so I use the Pluto code, which is a grid-based hydrodynamics code. Um, and we also use some Lagrangian passive tracer particles. So uh, that's shown on the right here. Um, and uh, we inject uh, conical relativistic magneto hydrodynamic jets. Um, and uh, on the left here, we have the density evolution of this particular jet. Um, so I mentioned uh, rotation measure depends on magnetic fields. So previously at UTAS, um, we had a jet setup, but we didn't have uh, magnetic field support in our jet setup. So my PhD has basically been adding magnetic fields into our setup. Uh, so yeah, so um, I'll talk a little more on that soon. But um, another thing we do pretty well at UTAS is generating synthetic surface brightness um, images. Um, and so we do this using these particles uh, with a co code called Praise. Uh, so this is using the particles from Pluto and uh, modeling, analytic modeling from a uh, model called Rays. So P plus Rays, Rays. Um, so here, these particles, what I'm showing is the uh, evolution of the, um, the age of the particle, I guess. So in the simulation, the particles are uh, advected with the fluid flow, and we keep track of when these particles pass through shocks, because Pluto is pretty good at um, detecting where shocks are, so we can keep uh, a history of where the shocks uh, where the particles run into these shocks. And so we can take that and we can uh, apply our analytic modeling to generate um, the synchrotron uh, emission and create a nice surface brightness map. And of course, you'd never see the evolution of an AGM jet. Um, this is happening, happening over millions of years, but it's pretty cool to have them in the um, So yeah, so our code pros um, includes uh, different loss processes, so adiabatic, synchrotron, and inverse Compton loss processes. Um, and we do have a couple of assumptions, but they are kind of being worked on. So um, a main assumption that I'm working on is this um, magnetic field mapping to pressure. So for the synchrotron radiation calculation, synchrotron radiation, you've got electrons spiraling around magnetic field lines, depends on the magnetic field. 
previously we didn't have magnetic fields in our setup. So we had to make some assumption about, okay, so the magnetic field, probably something like pressure. Okay, let's use pressure. Uh, so I'm working on removing that assumption um, as kind of the next step in my PhD. Uh, so yeah, so magnetic fields. There's two main magnetic fields in these simulations. We've got the jet and the environment. So in the jet, I'm injecting a toroidal field. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, it's a conical jet. So we've kind of got loops going up the cone. Um, got a 2D and 3D representation here. And then in the environment, uh, we've seeded that with a comma bar of uh, turbulent spectrum. Um, thanks, Peyton, for the code. <laughs> and thanks, Martin, for also the paper on uh, this stuff. Um, and so we can put these two things together and get a nice looking jet in this magnetic field. Um, so yeah, magnetic fields, that's basically my whole jet. Uh, I spent like a year on this. <laughs> um, and so we can take that and we've got, uh, I've done three simulations here. So we've got kind of our base simulation on the left here. Um, this is a lower power jet in a uh, higher density environment. Um, then the kind of main comparison is the one in the middle, which is a high power jet in a lower density environment. Um, and then the one on the right here is pretty much the same as the one on the left, but it's got a stronger environment magnetic field. Um, so one thing that might be somewhat obvious when we look at this is uh, this region around the um, jet cocoon. So this kind of purple um, material that's really low density, uh, that's the actual AGM jet cocoon. That's where the emission is being radiated from. And around this is uh, the shock to ambient medium. So the jet, the jet is traveling supersonically. Um, and it drives a bow shock, which shocks the medium um, around it and compresses it into this kind of shell of material. And we call this the Faraday screen. Um, so the whole point of this right, was to uh, generate three simulations that looked fairly similar in the radio image. Uh, so we could tell them apart using the rotation measure. So here are their radio images. Uh, they are not exactly identical, but um, it would be tricky to tell that there was a significant difference in the jet and environment properties between these. Um, and this is a size luminosity track like I had earlier. Um, we've got these evolutionary tracks. Um, and here we're comparing, so this gold star is uh, Cygnus A. So these images are at 151 megahertz. Um, so yeah, so we're kind of comparing to Cygnus A. I've uh, picked um, simulation parameters so that our kind of base simulation looks somewhat like some things. But yeah, so what we can see, yep, they're pretty similar in radio properties. Great. Can we tell them apart with the rotation measure? So here are their rotation measure maps. Um, different magnitudes. That's, that's the main uh, thing here. And so uh, these are the spatial maps, but we can also look at a distribution of values. Uh, so the distribution kind of shows it fairly clearly. So purple was that kind of base simulation. Pink is the higher jet power and cyan is the higher magnetic field. So you can see that they look totally different in the rotation measure distribution, which is great. That's what we want to do. Um, but you know, that's kind of the start of the story. Um, we can go further into this. Um, start looking at the components. So a bit to talk about here, but um, just- Sorry, before you yeah. go any further, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah. The, all the different simulations, are they using the same ambient, the initial ambient field setup? Yes. Yeah, that's why they all look- basically. Yes, so the, yeah, yeah totally, great point. Uh, let's go back. So yeah, so they have the same kind of, um, like there's this line down the middle that's the same. So. The structure of the magnetic field is the same in all three, but um, the strength in this one is twice the other. Yeah, yeah all good. Um, cool, yeah. So those maps I just showed again, these correspond to these three maps. So we've got um, base simulation, high jet power, high magnetic field. I know I went from horizontal to vertical, confusing. Um, and I've split uh, this into a couple of components. 
So when we do the rotation measure calculation, it's along the line of sight. So we can split this up into everything kind of before the jet and everything uh, in that Faraday screen I mentioned earlier. We don't deal with uh, internal Faraday rotation. Um, as we saw, the jet cocoon is really low density anyway, um, and rotation measure depends on density. So uh, it's probably going to be a fairly low value. So we kind of ignored it here. Um, so yeah, so we can split it up into everything leading up to where that kind of shocked shell around the jet is, everything in that shock shell. Um, and we can tell that the shock shell is the kind of dominant component here, um, which uh, makes sense. We saw earlier that the shell was high density um, and also had um, amplified magnetic field values. So um, it makes sense that the majority of the rotation measure signals coming from there. And these two last columns, um, on the right, so the reference column is, so I've taken the same kind of limits of the integration for each line of sight as for where we have a jet, but I've done the calculation for the zero million years uh, equipment for simulation. So there's no jet physically there, so we can compare what the jet has kind of done to the environment. Um, and so that's, uh, this difference column is the total minus the reference. So you can see that the jet, um, has impacted the environment and has changed what rotation measures uh, values we're getting on the map. Um, and primarily we're kind of getting edge enhancements, particularly towards the top load. Um, and yeah, last thing to mention as well, with this difference um, of the difference between the total and the references, we're getting kind of this um, reversal, this gradient across uh, the top lobe um, seems to be something that the jet is doing uh, by compressing the um, field in the Faraday screen because that's what we're kind of seeing in the screen there. So this is all well and good, lots of theory, but um, I'm sure that uh, what people are also interested in is uh, Kind of a synthetic observation. So not just going, okay, yeah, great, we've got these maps, but what can we actually see with it? So another big group of images, um, but we've got the raw simulation data, so that's that total uh, column again from the last slide. Um, then stepping through um, this second column, uh, I've taken that data and interpolated it to a uniform one kiloparsec grid. Um, the simulation is actually run on a stretched grid which makes the magnetic field stuff really hard, but I won't get into that. Um, so interpolated to a one kiloparsec uniform grid, then convolved it with a three arc second beam, and then applied a dynamic range threshold. So um, again, at 151 megahertz, um, applied a dynamic range threshold of 10. Um, it's kind of an extreme threshold, uh, just to show um, how much information we could be losing if we had um, a low dynamic range threshold. Uh, dynamic range. Um, so so with these observations, we can uh, look at that distribution of rotation measures again and see if it's any different. So, oh no. Why is that in the middle of the slide? All right, fun PowerPoint things. Sorry about that. but. In this uh, top panel, uh, we've got those distributions separated out by simulation. So um, our base simulation, higher power, higher magnetic field. And we see that the distribution doesn't change too much um, when we have those different um, kind of steps of the observability stuff. Um, so that's good. So the next kind of analysis we can do is to look at the structure function of the rotation measure. So uh, for those who don't know what the structure function is, which was me about two months ago, <laughs> it is a measure of the kind of spatial structure of the rotation measure. So um, we calculate it kind of taking each pair of points on the map, calculate the difference, square it, and then for each kind of distance, we we'll sort it into um, bins and take the average over. So that's what I plotted on this bottom panel here. 
Um, and we can kind of see it follows this parallel slope. Uh, so this gray dash line is the theoretical um, Kolmogorov um, structure function. Um, and then, so for each simulation, we can see it kind of follows this more or less um, power law, and then it turns over. So this turnover is actually associated with the scale of the kind of width of how wide the rotation measure map is. Um, and so this turnover is due to kind of the shape that the jet gives, uh, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, and another thing, so the different lines it might be a little hard to see um, on the screen, sorry about that, but uh, we've got the, the cyan line is that reference to that undisturbed environment line um, that um, tracks pretty well with what where the jet line is. So in the structure function in the lower power jet simulation, so the left and the right, it's the jet structure function looks pretty much the same as the environment structure. So there's uh, not actually a lot of difference uh, between those there. But for the higher power jet case, the jet actually amplifies the rotation measure uh, a lot more above the environment level. Um, so uh, this side line down here compared to like the purple line up. Um, so that was a pretty cool finding. Um, but the, the downside to this is blue line here, that's our dynamic range threshold limited rotation measure map. So we lose that information if we're dynamic range limited. Um, but another side to the observability is actually whether um, the source would even be polarized and would even be able to get a rotation measure map to begin with. So we need polarized emission to find our rotation measures. So uh, here, and this is like the second last slide, I promise. <laughs> uh, we have uh, depolarization frequency maps for our free simulations. So the depolarization frequency is the frequency at which uh, the polarized intensity drops to 50% of its um, maximum value. So the uh, what we find is um, that the different simulations have very different kind of profiles of uh, depolarization. So on the right here is um, what we're doing is taking uh, a particular frequency, going, okay, if the depolarization frequency at a particular spot on our rotation measure map is, um, get this right, um, the depolarization frequency is above the particular frequency we're selecting as our observing frequency, then we lose that information. We can't see it. Um, and so we essentially uh, only see parts of information as we go to low and lower frequencies, we're losing more information depending on what the depolarization frequency is. Uh, and so uh, we're plotting here the um, measured full width at half maximum of the distribution of rotation measure values that are left after we've made this cut using the depolarization frequency. Um, and so we can see for our three simulations, they're all the profiles at which um, we can see the rotation measure distribution are quite different to one another. Uh, and we can actually uh, see the differences in the environments uh, this way. And yeah, so that's kind of the most recent thing about this paper, which was pretty fun to do. Um, so finally, to kind of take it all back to uh, the idea of jet feedback and why we care about simulating these things in the first place is um, with our simulations, we can look at kind of where the energy is and where it's going and how we're interacting with them, where the jet is interacting with the environment. So jets do feedback in kind of two major ways. We heat the gas and we also move the gas. So if, when we move the gas outside uh, the cluster potential, um, that's also another source of feedback. So in our different simulations, our higher power jet actually increases the temperature of the gas it affects a lot more than our lower power jets. Um, and our 
um, low power jets actually affect more gas. We saw that the kind of uh, screen, that Faraday screen I pointed out, was thicker around those jets. So um, we have some differences in feedback that we can quantify here, um, which was pretty neat. So yeah, just to kind of summarize uh, my project over the last a while, um, we want to know what our uh, AGN jet energetics are uh, so we can get a better idea of AGN jet feedback. Um, but we have this degeneracy in the um, kinetic power and environment density. And so we can't um, just look at the source and go, okay, it's that bright, it must have that jet power. Uh, but what we can do is um, use the rotation measures as, as a proof of that kind of line of sight dimension and our environment. Um, and we can actually, <laughs> we can differentiate between our environments. So what we found was that uh, the distributions of the rotation measure are quite different in each of our environments. And also that <coughs> the depolarization properties of um, our different jets are quite different. And so we can look at the environments using the depolarization properties. So Um, so yeah, so we can estimate AGN environments and energetics, and we can look at the feedback in those cases. But, um, what was happening to the um, the fields of weather as you got close to the holes? Is it just set up similar to just drop in or did it start doing some bunch of stuff? Did you get Yeah, it's basically a thing. And, and, um, close to the hole, so near the event horizon, what was happening to the uh, fields? <laughs> So we don't actually simulate the no, you're doing microscope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so this yeah. is pill oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Are you actually done? Sorry, it's an entirely irrelevant. <laughs> So uh, how closely do the dispersion measures that you simulate and then the structure functions uh, correspond to what observers end up seeing? Yeah, great question. So um, the kind of Oh, <laughs> sorry, catching the throat. <laughs> the rotation measures, so as, as I mentioned, we pick the parameters to be somewhat similar to sigma say, and, and looking at um, polarization, rotation measure observations of sigma say, we yeah. find quite similar values uh, in extreme maximum values of the rotation measure. Um, they didn't actually. Um, have a plot of the distribution, um, so we can really compare that. But um, we will get there. Cool. <laughs> we will get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the um, but yeah. So <clears throat> what I had to compare to was like some uh, statistics, and yeah. So we get a similar maximum values. Um, Sigma say I think is actually in a slightly um, higher magnetic field environment. Um, so ours all thought by a you know, factor of two or something like that. Um, so yeah. So somewhat similar to the observations in terms of magnitudes and um, another thing, so the kind of uh, gradient across the globe that I pointed out, um, that's also something that has been seen in observations as well. Um, not quite sure what the uh, source that was in the particular galaxy was the, um, the, the spider web protocol. Um, and yeah, so they thought it might be um, some 
the helical field of the deck. You've seen that reverse. But I think we're seeing it in the actual <coughs> Faraday screen with the uh, shocked material that's being put out by the depth. So, yeah, the, there are some features that are definitely similar to prospecting. And structural functions, um, yeah, we did see some similarities. Like often the structural functions, they yeah, have the same kind of follow the power law slope and then deviate at some no, uh, so when you image actual radio data, um, pretty on T clean can introduce biases mm. to the images. Um, so I think there was some papers recently where it showed if you eat T clean and then look at the spectral index, you can see a striking approval. You don't okay. see that if you're imaging properly. So I was wondering if the radio maps you get, does that come with simulated visibilities so that you can actually test with real imaging techniques <laughs> or are you just literally getting a blog? Just getting a blog, okay. yeah. Um, I mean, that'd be great. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so like the, um, hang on, I'll go back to the... Um, you can absolutely do that. You probably wouldn't mind, so. And get on maps to Yeah, like, I mean, because everybody's made these wonderful, beautiful images, and the last thing you want to do is ruin them. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, but it's more. Yeah. So, yes, but we kind of what we calculate, like for each particle, we calculate an associated intensity and we integrate that down, kind of, I guess, else go integrate what uh, emission comes to it. So, I'm sure, yeah, we could definitely do that, but. It's like the SKA is too low with So great. True. Time for another question before Martin's power. I Stuff. Um, what did it go to me? So yeah. this is kind of really um, been idealized in a, in a way other than the stuff that they would do, right? And the, mm. I guess the other thing that is in your observations, but is in your simulations, is the, the Milky Way. Right? Which yeah. messes with your rotation measures, right? Um, so how do you, mm. do you know how you kind of disentangle between the two? How do you, how do you ensure that what you're seeing is, is that is not? In our own backyard, I don't know. Yeah, great question. Um, of course, being a simulator, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know a whole lot about it. Yeah. But, it's entirely fair. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like you don't know what else is in you, like between you and the source. There yeah. could be any number of components, uh, not just like whatever else is there. Um, so I imagine it would be rather hard to disappear. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure observers have, have ways of telling kind of what distance the app, like if it's associated with another you know, intervening star or galaxy, there might be ways to tell this. But, yeah. Like there are different estimates of like galactic protection, whatever direction you it's something that is done, but I'm not sure if it has. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm just we can tell you out. And the part of the so you need to do this for large sample things. Yeah, yeah, but it's been I mean it's been done that you know the the, the RN sky is being mapped out again and again. We 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 yeah. don't know like what yes. when I was doing so. That figure at the end about the about the depolarization mm. of the frequency. Um, was I reading that wrong when I concluded that one of the conclusions from the slide is do not do polarization stuff with their body? Don't do it with the And what I find that I mean, you've been saying is well, uh, virtually mm. like you know, what I personally find is when you look at the surviving of the actually, and then if you see that as you go to the lower frequencies, uh, we have the middle of the frequency, uh, we get more of the hospital. I think for the alpha, you would predict that actually the sum of the alpha would be the Yes. Which is actually Yes, statistical distributions in the right that if you square the probably you already know of what's going on with us. Yes, my activities are already working. Yeah, totally. Let me say something about this. This is Um, so. Yes, when you're when you're looking at the depolarization of frequency, you're yeah. using some sort of samples. So Martin will probably know a little more about this than I do, uh, but <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is estimated from simulations of multi-scale magnetic fields. We looked at basically the material cubes. One arm ago, it's a very powerful spectrum. Yeah. And uh, in the middle of one. One to the power of six hundred percent deviation. And it deviates from the burn law. So the burn law, or classical burn law, which have a two weeks instead of, so we have 20 years. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, so. So the, 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 the context of this question is I've yeah. also got a student doing this. Yeah, so, sure. then, uh, um, so we I mean we talk about it, we have together, but um, the we, we we this was based on something some stuff that I did ages ago showing up. My feeling is you probably don't get a super relationship. That's what we were planning to do was mm. to actually sim simulate the Stokes Q and U and then make a full, you know, so, so what you're doing is you're kind of skipping a step where you're saying that we've got a dynamic range of interpretation of RN. Um, but actually, if you if you image if you made images of Q and U um, and then derive your properties from those, it's a pain because you've actually got to do it and you can't just make image of RN, you've got to make many images of Q and U and exactly yeah. simulate the process that you go through with these. So these mass cap data cubes all the way down. Um, when you do that, I suspect it pushes down your polarized signal even further. Um, so you get something positively similar to this, but once that is completely different. Yeah. Other, which we're getting into the experiments in the text. Of course, it then often then we respond to the function of tubes. So it's an intrinsic combination of the source and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
yet. I can feel the cluster down about 100 megahertz and that case. So it's going to be a Yeah, so the next kind of step um, in the page is actively do full, um, like, yeah, full, giving you uh, actual uh, full polarization stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>